everybody hello 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 welcome to uh this is not an official complete croc video since i don't have my usual co-hosts it's been a while since i've been here i know um but i'm here with gary edwards and we're here to discuss phenomenology uh gary why don't you say hi and introduce yourself to the people uh, the two or three of them who don't know who you are All three <laughs> yeah. um yeah i'm gary edwards i'm a english philosopher um and uh, i have a youtube channel and all of that i think still uh, i haven't checked in the last five minutes in the current environment you never know um yeah and yeah i'm 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 a critic of phenomenology really uh but i think it's interesting the role that it plays in the um current um set of arguments around social justice so why don't we begin with uh, sort of a, a, a starting point for phenomenology, which is, of course, phenomena, um, the, the things that present themselves to our five senses, um, which, which did not, be, you know, th this is not something that began with phenomenology. I think it was uh, most famously expounded upon by the empiricist, wasn't it? It was, yeah. I mean, uh, sort of like um, empiric empiricists like Berkeley, uh, particular, in particular, sort of, um, yeah, placed the phenomenal realm or the empirical realm uh, very much to the fore, and it was Kant's and it was Kant's response to that that sort of uh, led to his famous transcendental ideal, and then and the distinction he made between the appearance and the thing in itself, um, which was very much counter to Kant's previous rationalism. So, yeah, it, it started in empiricism to some degree. It also started, I suppose, to some degree as a, re as a response or a reaction against uh, Descartes and his objective, uh, and especially the, the uh, res existentia part of Descartes' picture. So it has its roots in early modern and uh, enlightenment philosophy, yes, although it takes a particular romantic and, and sort of anti-modern and anti-enlightenment turn as it goes on, I, I think. Yes, I think I think what really um, separates the phenomenologists' understanding of phenomena <clears throat> from the understanding of phenomena that preceded them is the introduction of intentionality into this. That's right, yes. The, the aboutness of, 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 in particular, mental states or state, uh, states of consciousness, that they are about an object. Or that they are about something, um, and then Brentano famously said that is the mark of the mental. Brentano is the person who really kicked off modern phenomenology in the eighteen seventies. So yeah, it's um, it's 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 it was the it was like a, it was like coming to term. And this is why it's actually is it has it has its roots in sort of anti naturalism and anti positivism because it was coming to terms with limitations of what what was seen as being the sort of like the uh, materialistic objective sense uh, sciences in Germany in the in the, in the mid to late nineteenth century. There was some there was some uneasiness, especially on Kant along Kantian lines of treating people as objects rather than than, than as as, mean, as beings with uh, meaningful ends and so there was a response to that and 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 it starts pulling away from perhaps a materialistic or a scientific worldview around that time around the and around around the the emergence of the neo kantians Although of course there were there were there were, there were earlier things there's a guy called Gustav Troisen who was um, really a, a philosopher of history. And he was sort of from about 1808 to 1880, something he lived. And he, he was the first one to make a, a clear distinction between the natural sciences that are aimed at explaining the objective world, what he called aklarenosum, I think that's how you pronounce it. And there was, um, and, and the historical world, uh, the historical science, which are replete with human meaning, which he called the Verstehen. The, um, the 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 interpreted world. So, how exactly does the introduction of intentionality into phenomena um, lend itself to an anti-natural worldview? 
because that relation of aboutness is 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 presumed to be irreducible you can't um capture that or explain it in terms of what naturalists or physicists or you know objective scientific realists talk about this there's a there's supposed to be an inherent irreducibility mm. and that opens the door for all sorts of interpretivist uh sort of more nebulous kind of uh uh, methodologies to be employed and of course the problem with that is you can reach whatever conclusion you want right well eventually um it, it can lead to that yeah obviously it's a little more idealistic and idealism can be a little frictionless with regards to reality it can it can it can get caught up in its own chasing its own tail in its mind so it, there's a there's a threat of that although in throughout the history of phenomenology there are many phenomenologists who've recognized that danger and have, have sought to 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 address it with varying degrees of success uh but yeah it's certainly it's certainly it's certainly a, um it's certainly a threat worth burning might or, or, or argue or criticisms of phenomenology that raise that shouldn't be dismissed out of hand you could very easily get into a position of of, of being almost um you know almost a phenomenalist of thinking that that that, 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 that what's real is what's present in your consciousness yes. that, that risk is always there yes i i i look at uh the kind of auto ethnographies they get published on uh, real peer review you know <clears throat> and and i i read um sort of what herself thought about these matters and and you know like you said he was more uh more concerned than than some of his successors many of his successors um with the fact that phenomenology could be abused in this manner, and it seemed he wanted to preserve some semblance of objectivity. Well, some semblance of critical and, and, and suspension, of uh, uh, skeptical suspension. Yeah, the way you bracket you bracket certainty in the in the in the face. You don't think, well, I have this view, uh, uh, you know, so I'm, and it's in my mind, and my mind is some portal to truth, so I can just believe in it. He was, he he took steps against that. So did Heidegger to some to some extent, but um, I know perhaps it's the influence of a general postmodern um, kind of interpretivism, people like Karl Otto Appel, and things like that, and 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 and, and Michael. Bachtin and, and 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 thinkers like that. I think they came along, uh, and they they loosened that a bit. Especially, you know, they that 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 became a little bit looser. That 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 kind of Hercelian concern with critical distance and critical reflection, uh, probably yeah. inadvertently. They probably they probably be as horrified <laughs> as anybody. But it certainly seems to have played the the the, the worst as aspects of phenomenology seem to have played a role in the current obsession with with lived experience as epistemic foundation yes before we get to um the the contemporary the, the postmodern age though there is uh, you mentioned an important character in this story and that is heidegger um yeah so so uh what what, what did he do what what, what was his uh, contribution to this particular matter um well he was originally herself's student um they had a falling out well they had two fallings out the first falling out was uh was um to do with technical doctrine the second falling out that heidegger was a was a nazi and her was a jew yeah um but they were focusing on the primary falling out um uh if, if i recall it correctly he interpreted some aspects of her as being a little bit too individualistic and a, a little bit too much trapped in the De the Cartesian objective approach, as if he was, if he's, if he, as if he, as if Herschel was still looking for objects in the world for uh, us for the mind for mental states of consciousness to be intentional about. Uh, so he he, he he thought that Herschel was was holding on to Cartesian objectivity a little too much. And he, and he attended in and he, he distanced himself in that way and he saw it was less perhaps not surprisingly less individualistic than her cell less psychological less concerned with the psychology of the individual and more concerned with kind of collective um being as in being amongst others and that 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 was the general sort of like um the general way that Heidegger differed from her cell.
Hello? Hello? Oh dear, dead air. <laughs> yes, so Heidegger was a Nazi. <laughs> and it, it, it was really bad. Oh dear, King Crocodile seems to have vanished. So I seem to be. Uh... Oh, are you back? Hello, I heard breath. Okay, so yes. Uh, and then from Heidegger came. Um, Came Sartre, Sartre, Bovier, uh, Milo Ponte. Um, that's and so you get into existentialism. Um, you get and then you get the post structuralists come in. So there's a kind of a historical, there's a historical um, ribbon here moving through continental philosophy from Descartes via Berkeley, perhaps then into Kant. Um, Hegel, of course, originated the term phenomenology, but his mm. phenomenology, again, was very different to that of, of, of 20th century phenomenologists. Quick question. And then you get, I haven't um, been speaking all the time, by the way. I had, did notice that you dropped out there. <laughs> no, no, I, I, was, I, I, was, I, was, I was still here. I, I heard everything. Uh, it was just my, my mic, uh, for some reason, got muted. It, it, my my uh, computer didn't recognize it for a moment. So if that happens again, uh, just just look at the chats on the sidebar. So I'm, it, I'm still there. Yeah. It had a lapse in its intentional field. Yes. Clearly. <laughs> yes. Uh, but my quick question, um, Heidegger, he did introduce hermeneutics into phenomenology, didn't he? Um, he made a close. Yeah. He he made a closer link between them. Yeah. He was the one who took a secularized version of hermeneutics and 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 sort of integrated it into into Herschel's phenomenology whereas Herschel as like I was saying was had a slightly more um uh less general view more psychologically limited individualistic kind of you know he still maintained the uh, the, the 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 I or the self as an object whereas Heidegger dispensed with that and he brought in a secularized form of interpret of of, of, of interpretism, but it, it, the but the the the, the post Kantianism and all that was already in her cell. Uh, her cell was very influenced by a guy called Wilhelm Dilthe, um, who a historian, was historian, uh, right? And now that was the good historian is Deuce, Deuce and, uh, uh Wilhelm's a little later. Um, but he, in turn, he was influenced by Joyston as well. So, but Dilthe was the guy, he was kind of an interesting figure because he was an outsider from the academic realm, but he, 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 he pioneered a lot of the stuff about interpretivism. And, and he was an influence on, uh, on Herschel. Along, of course, with Frege, Herschel started by trying to, you know, with the, with the, with the, um, debate about uh, the status of mathematical and formal objects whether they're psychologistic or not so it's an, that's an interesting shared route with the analytic tradition although they both went very different ways eventually so well i brought up hermeneutics um because as, as far as i understand it um when you couple it to phenomenology what you effectively end up with is an interpretation of signifiers uh, in society, and you you sort of interpret them as as your uh, uh, your you, your consciousness is effectively shaped by these uh, this this constellation of signifiers um, that that your mind assigns meaning to. Sure, that's 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 right, and um, that's that's kind of that's one of the that's one of the major points of, of divergence between the analytic and the and the continental and this is the role of the is the theories of meaning and semantics but yeah that that is what happens which is interesting in a way i suppose because why are why do those signifiers those semiotic signs why do they why are they um why can't they be interpreted away or bracketed? Why are they? Why are they? Why are they part of the world? Why are they part of the facticity of the world? Which is an interesting question. I think in Heidegger's case, because he obviously has some kind of collectivist kind of project in mind. We keep alluding to his Nazism, don't we? We have to get that out of the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, but, it's 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 strange. His um his teacher herself and his most famous pupil Derrida were mm. both Jews and he was a Nazi. Uh it's uh it's it's a strange and he 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 was a lover of Hannah Arendt, wasn't he? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, Man, this, that, this, 
<laughs> and yet, and yet he was, uh, he was, he, uh, you know, the, 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 they used to say, oh, he didn't have much to do with the return. No, he was a fairly enthusiastic Nazi as well. And, you know, you can't help but speculate whether some of the things he um, champions in terms of collective identity and, and, and giving and sort of meaning giving kind of community had, had, had some role to play in that. And one suspects it does. And that comes from what he saw as semiotics as the sort of like the symbolism and the signs of belonging, the things that can orientate your life in, 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 in a sort of like a meaningful way. And it still has its, still has its descendants today. I mean, in, 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 I would say in the likes of Charles Taylor and other communitarians who do offer fairly decent criticisms of liberalism to some degree, the, the individualism of liberalism. So there's something in it, but there's also something dangerous in it. Mm. As a side note, um, there are people, you know, we, we were talking about um, Heidegger uh, being sort of one of the theoretical ancestors of uh, much of what we see today, um, and uh, this, you know, this this is just a cheeky little observation. But um, as I, as I mentioned in one of my science wars videos, they will implicate the scientific enterprise as being this sexist, awful thing because Bacon once said these horrible, supposedly sexist, horrible things. But I wonder if they look back on the fact that they employ methodologies that were developed by an actual Nazi and apply the same kind of fallacious genetic reasoning to themselves. Uh, you know, for for all the time they spend staring at their own belly buttons, they 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 don't they they seem to overlook this uh, this 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 little embarrassment. Yeah, it be it would be it would be embarrassing. It would be embarrassing. But then you go, you don't, it, 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 it real ultimately it doesn't really matter whether it was a Heidegger was a Nazi. You can actually examine these ideas independently of that. Yes, there's there's obviously some connection you know it's it's often it's 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 obviously fascinating to say well heidegger was more of a collectivist heidegger was you know more about finding meaning and in being amongst being amongst others and herschel was kind of more of like a liberal individualist it's 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 interesting but heidegger's ideas stand up despite in as much as they stand up at all you know can be can be viewed separately from um his political affiliations um but yeah, it is. It is interesting that what's I'm, I forgot the guy's name. The guy who brought um, phenomenology to France. Uh, um, oh, what was his name? He shares the name with a fairly recent philosopher as well. But he was the teacher of all these people, and, and it, it moves from Germany to France, um, especially immediately after the Second World War. It's initially in the nineteen thirties, and then after the Second World, World War, it sort of moves. To sort of France, and you have the French thinkers like Merleau Ponty, uh, who, who start off as structuralists, clearly because of the mm -hmm. times, but then you get then you get you start getting your Derridas and you get your people that were post structuralists from the, from about the middle of the sixties, um, <clears throat> and that's perhaps where you start getting that mixture of phenomenology, hermeneutics, and and and, and a quite intense skepticism about categories yes uh, in the meantime in the meantime derrida is coming out with deconstructionism you know his sure. his his doctoral thesis was um it, it was i think on on herself wasn't it uh yes. yeah. yeah yeah and 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 uh this this was where he was um this is where yeah that was introduced in like the 50s or 60s so we we go from heidegger and herself to the postmodernists. um what what exactly changed what was the transition okay so I suppose you could say, I mean, for, they didn't call themselves postmodernists for about 12 years. Postmodernism yeah. only camp cropped, the word term only cropped up in Leithard in 79. But, um, okay, what you have is, so you, you, for, you, from her cell, you've got phenomenology. You've got sort of like the initial idea of phenomenology as, as, the, as the study of, con of the experience of consciousness. And it's, it's basically a disinterpretive uh, process in her cells approach where you, you 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 bracket the normal interpretations that you bring to one's conscious experience and sort of let it breathe and experience is therefore in the way things are you know like sometimes when you see an optical illusion and you you look at it and you can't believe what you see so you stop believing then you see what's there that kind of thing is what you had from her cells phenomenology 
then Heidegger's come along and Heidegger has basically said, well, no, that's that's a bit still a bit too objective, a bit a bit too sort of like uh, individualistic and psychologist psychological in its interpretation. We have to we have to be beings in the world. Being is being in the world. We have to spread out and and make our border the borders of the self more porous and open to influences, which is where the permeneutics comes in. And um then what's happened is that's gone to some degree to the towards French existential traditions, uh, where there's a sort of there's a kind of freedom comes into it where you can you can make yourself in the light of your your interpretations. And then we get to postmodernism, which is where the categories that of previously informed thought or previously held bound thought rigidly to reason a sort of a uh, sort of criminalized in a way a sort of quite painted as being well this is why we had that bloody war this is why there's racism and colonialism we, you know it's 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 our essentialism about categories we have to we have to loosen that and that gets added into the mix as well so what you end up with i suppose is you end up with i have an inter you know i have this phenomenology um that 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 i have to i have to distance myself from my assumptions my 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 the the the, the labor shot the lived world and see it for what it is um and there but then there's an interpretive framework going on there which is like oh but there's this political framework so i, I loosen all the categories and then what reveals itself is is this this dialectic struggle. Let's go back to Hegel. This dialectic struggle between the oppressor and, and the oppressor, and that becomes like the interpretive framework for lived experience. So the standpoint is to the lived experience, what the theory is in science to the observation. But unfortunately, I think if you've weakened your categories to the degree that some people are run with postmodernism if you weaken it that much you run the risk of not being able to, to 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 reflect critically on your standpoint or your theory so it becomes dogma and i think that's basically what's happened yes there is there is certainly an unhealthy obsession and faith with the lived experience of well, certain select groups of people, if you belong to it, another it, group. <laughs> it becomes sacrosanct. It's almost become sacrosanct. And and you 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 mark out the people who don't agree with you uh as as the other. Yeah. And then you 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 basically try and get likes on Twitter by 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 defaming them. You know, and, and then being sarcastic and just putting them down all the time. So it's 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 an unfortunate combination. I don't think people like herself, certainly, and not even Heidegger would, would be particularly happy with that combination of um, of factors, uh, or the way the the way it's turned out in current in current critical theory. Um, you know, so yeah, it's it's an, it's a, it's an interesting story, and of course, ultimately, it all goes back to Kant, and, and you know, Kant's Kant's sort of. Um, Kant wasn't particularly clear what he meant by things in themselves and appearances, uh, particular and, 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 and the continental tradition, especially the Prussian idealists, took and run with a particular interpretation of that. I think we live with the consequences of that to this day. <laughs> All right, that's a lot to take in. Um, so, uh, what, what what sort of prescription um, might you offer? Well, you can, you can, okay, well, I'm a naturalist. Yeah, my, my approach to uh, knowledge in general, sort of in scientific, any inquiry that calls itself scientific or seeks knowledge is, is, is takes it as being continuous with the natural sciences. Now, you can, at a stretch, have a kind of naturalistic phenomenology if you start with lived experience, but you don't end there. I think we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. So you can sort of like, you can you can start with ethnographies. You can even start with autoethnographies. You can start with those kind of reports and, 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 and pragmatist studies of the use of language. You can start with that. But what you shouldn't do is say, well, X group X members of group X have spoken. The truth has been uttered. That's where all inquiry must end, or you're a shitload. 
Mm-hmm. You know, that, that you, that's that that's a bad move. That's 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 all you've done is you've you've you you've sullied the spirit of phenomenology by becoming a foundationalist. What we have to do is we have to carry on and we have to put the emerging theories into a form where they can be tested empirically and then you test them empirically and, and you know and they, they stand or fall on how they they stand up to the evidence which is you know which is 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 the naturalistic pattern is the scientific pattern it's it is that it is that thing of uh, the scientific pattern in general is a kind of know thyself thing it's knowing where um, the cognitive errors are what kind of errors people are prone to what kind of errors of reasoning and fallacies sort of in fact are thinking and taking taking means to minimize their influence you know? yes we were just we, we were uh, discussing um before the stream started um you know there are all these these uh, psychological heuristics um that we use these mental shortcuts we take um and the phenomenologists are almost certainly uh, aware of these um, and yet they're, they're still treating lived experience as though it's the Pope speaking ex cathedra. Hmm. Yeah. Nah. That's it. It's like, it's like a set, the, the, the actual skeptical roots or, or which were in rehearsal of, 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 a, of, of a creation of, of, of suspending judgment and saying, well, I don't know this, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to pontificate on it. Um, that's, that's been, that's disappeared of late because, People just like belong. They've, they've gone down that thing of like they like belonging to the group. It's it's not being in the world. It's being on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. it's that thing of it's that thing of they like the likes, the affirmations. They like their identity that comes with that. Um, they like the reaffirmation from people they consider on their side, and and they like hurting people or trying to hurt people who are on the other side. Um, and that's so you know and that's that's where phenomenology can become dangerous. Because it, it, because people s- seem to think that because something is is present to them in their experience, and they have the experience of the of the, of the privileged group of the previously unprivileged group, that it's 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 a fa- it's a foundational grounds of knowledge, and people do do that. I know that we've, we've all seen people doing this, uh, and we know that lived experience has become a sacred thing, and if you if you even deign to criticize the standpoint from which that live in, in which that lived experience is 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 formed and is shaped then you're you're a white supremacist or you're suffering from from uh white fragility or whatever it is those those narratives come out very easy very quickly you're erasing the voices and bodies of group x you know. sure yeah that's it that's it yeah that that, that that's that's that doesn't sound like somebody bracketing their interpretations of their of their phenomenological field to me. That sounds like something very different, you know. Yeah. But it's at the same time, it's recognizable where it came from. People have gone, oh, you see, you can't criticize my because it's all about it's all about you know it's all about it's all about interpretation. It's about understanding and meaning. You know, reality is constructed by people. It's qualitative. It's not objective and out there, so it's got it, it's inherited that, but but it's it's, it's got rid of the, the the actually the interesting stuff in phenomenology, which was the which was the suspension of interpretation. There's a very definite interpretation here. Yes, and I'm going to make it a point whenever I hear or see somebody preface a statement with something to the effect of speaking as a lesbian of color, I'm going to counter with something to the effect of speaking as somebody with a healthy respect for truth. <laughs> yeah yeah it's it, it is like it is like it's like the credentials or it's like, they, like they, they whip out a badge and it's like it's like you know you've got to obey me now it's like doctor who's psychic paper you just you just see you just see what you oh no i better not i better not i'll, better not, I'll get in trouble uh every yes everything you say is true you know which is which is terrible which is a terrible state this is the problem with 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 with, with postmodern category skepticism it doesn't make the world more if you if you if you make categories of thought indistinct or indiscreet you lose that it doesn't make the world more caring and open it makes people a lot more you're inviting authoritarianism and dogma it, people can't be wrong unless you've got a clear, clear idea of what categories are and where, and where, where the boundaries of things are 
how's anybody going to show you tell you you're wrong you you'll never be able to admit you're wrong you'll just have to be right about everything all the time and that's going to make you into a proper asshole one way or another yes uh how do you think i mean i i haven't actually um argued with many people who are cognizant of the role of that phenomenology plays um in in their ideology um but how do you think they would respond um, to, uh, you know, if, if you pointed out, if you showed them the studies, okay, this is this is the role that informational influence can have. This is this is the role that leading questions can have on on creating fake memories. Um, this is the role uh, that uh, that this or that cognitive heuristic can have on your reasoning. What 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 role does this play in your uncritical acceptance of lived experience? Uh, how do you think they would respond to that? Well, the, 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 the most unfortunate response is to write those things off to what would be as being artifacts of white male power or something. You know, uh, just just, just uh, gas, gaslighting the minorities and women. Yeah, that's it. It's just, you know, that, that, that'll be the accusation. And, you know, that, that's, that's possibly the worst thing they can do. But as you know, it's something that's not exactly unheard of. Um, but, yeah, yeah. Um, the best thing they can do, of course, is listen to you because you're right. You can all, you know, we can all be wrong. We should all, and, and, and especially, you know, this is perhaps the great virtue of, of what we've inherited in the scientific method or, or in, in that kind of enlightenment inquiry in general is it makes us reflect critically on things and it makes us sort of like go, oh, you know what? I've got a tendency to do this. I really need to work on that. Um, that would be the best thing to do. But I don't know. I don't know if there's an intermediate step. What's the intermediate step? Just sort of like a – there isn't one, is there? You can, you can either go, look, my reasoning is fallible and bound by, by, by categories and ideas that I have to respect. So, you know, unless I think I'm perfect or blessed because I'm some member of some Uber race, I have to really – I have to really think critically about these things. I have to give them some due attention and be charitable to my opponents. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, the, 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 how do you talk to people who won't listen to you? Maybe you have to tell stories. Maybe it's a question of, 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 of illustrating it with narratives and sort of like, like um, examples, even from their own history, the history of their standpoints. Their standpoints have a historical character, so you sort of turn in the hide, you're turning the Heidegger against them, but that kind of thing of being in constant a story or a narrative. Maybe mm -hmm. you have to sort of tell the story and spin the story so it sort of like catches them, you know, makes them aware that they might not be consistent with their own story, it might violate the, the the internal logic of their own story. Maybe that's the way to go with it. Uh, it's hard to judge how to do that though with people who are just not going to listen to you because you're of your color or your faith or whatever. Um, so it's, 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 it is a bit of a po the polarization, the illiberal polarization is, is, is a real problem. Divisiveness is a, is, is a real problem. I mean, it is the Novacek. It is the nerve gas of politics. It separates the muscle, the operation of the muscles from the nerves. Mm, that's a really good analogy or metaphor. Metaphor. Yeah. Sorry, I, I'm a I'm a physics guy. I'm not a link language guy. The fuck do I know about these things? <laughs> do, it, do it in maths. Do it in maths. No, James Clark Maxwell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it um it, it is an interesting suggestion using stories to try to get people to look up from their belly buttons at the world around them. Narratives yeah. do narratives do seem to have uh, uh more of effect more of an effect on people. Um, you know, my, my most popular videos, um, quantum or the quantum theory made easy videos. And, and these are videos where like, um, sort of the, 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 the style is I'm telling the story of how quantum mechanics, um, was developed. It's, it's, it's not a perfect story. There are a lot of things I'm leaving out. There are a lot of dead ends and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of arguments that, that I didn't put in there. Um, mm -hmm. but, but people seem to like the story. They, they seem it's to like that it leads story. somewhere. It's a really interesting story, and it's crammed full of really interesting characters, all kinds of eccentric Germans, you know, <laughs> all manner of eccentric Germans in that story. So yeah, it's it's good. It's a, it's a good story, and science often is a good story. 
you know, without popularizing, you know, without popularizing it too much. Science is actually a really interesting story. In, in a, in, and it, it, it shares, I think, the history of science shares something in common with the best stories in that it does make us aware of our of the of the frailty of our reasoning and and and, it, and its limits and our, our struggles to deal with it and how uh, you know there are, there are there are often people in 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 history of science who are, who are, who are ignored for, for 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 bad reasons and there's people who are ignored for good reasons so it makes us think about what uh, you know where how we accept or reject people's theories so it's a story with the moral it's a story with a moral, yeah. It's like a, it's like an Athenian play. Mm. It, it's it's supposed to make you reflect critically on things, which which is which is great, uh, you know, because that's 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 the thing that perhaps ties the best traditions in the arts and the best traditions in the sciences together. It's that it's that kind of inquiry under reason and and rash and and, and, and and inquiry under conditions of virtue of doing it well of doing it of, 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 of paying proper attention to it of, of cultivating the skill to do it um you know and that that's 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 kind of in, that's kind of interesting whereas if you just if somebody just snapped like a mouse trap when somebody's of the wrong type or they say the wrong words they're not doing that. They're turning their back on their back on that. And people on the left and the right do that. They've got that mouse trap thing going on. Um, that's unfortunate because you know that's that's perhaps one of the one of the virtues of liberalism is it make it, it forces you to think things through. All right. Well, uh, do you have anything to add on the topic of phenomenology uh, before we start taking questions? Um. I think we've we've pretty much gone through it. Perhaps galloped through it a bit too quickly, but, but you know. But I think generally, yeah. I think I think I think we've covered it. Um, yeah, I'm I'm skeptical of phenomenology, but I know that the worst the worst of it that we see now isn't really the real thing. I know that it's 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 something that's that's fashionable and shallow. Uh, even though I'm not a fan phenomenology because i find it a little bit too idealistic as a naturalist and as a physicalist i find it a little bit too uh mind orientated and mm -hmm. i'm quite a fan of psychologism as well i don't think frigga made quite as strong a case as people think or or that Kant. i don't think that Kant was i think that Kant was um equivocated equivocated about transcendental ideal so I'm, a, I'm not a fan of phenomenology but look I know it's not as bad as the, its worst adherents at present make make it look. Yes, unfortunately, they seem to be the most popular at the moment. Yeah, because it's it is it is it's 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 caught something that's going on generally in the culture and politically. Um, yes. yeah. it's fascinating to me how these different strands of thought, uh, how critical theory, how phenomenology, um, whatever else uh, I'm, I'm leaving out, uh, sort of. Uh, have this unholy marriage um, to produce whatever abomination we see today. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just that all the bad things have lined up, particularly forcibly, which is, which is unfortunate. And then you've got you've got a generation of people, both directions on the political campus, uh, who seek meaning in life. Uh, that's see, that's one of the reasons why we're not actually suffering from postmodernism. We're suffering from what comes immediately after postmodernism. Where meta narratives come back, but people aren't really equipped with the with the categorical rigor they used to have to deal with it because that's been undermined by postmodernism. I don't know what you'd call it, meta modernism or something. Um, so, but that's 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 an, that's that's the position we're in. It's, it's not an ideal position. So people are hypocritical, but they're also fired up, and that's 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 not a healthy uh, uh, situation. That's not to say we. You know, that's not to say the order that was went before the sort of neoliberal globalist order or whatever you'd like to call it, that was good because it, it wasn't. But the response to it, and in some, both on the left and the right, people aren't equipped to deal with meaning anymore. That's why when somebody like Jordan Peterson comes along, everybody's like, oh, that's what we need. <laughs> yeah, it really reaches out to people because he's a meta modernist, he's a meta modern life coach. In, you know, in that's, his, that's, that's the tradition that he's in. And you know, and people people respond to that, uh, but there you go. That's 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 the enlightenment hasn't fully been extinguished yet. Though. Yes, 
It's, it's interesting. Uh, meta narratives coming back, but people uh, not really being equipped um, to, to deal with them. So kind of like uh, useful bullshit is, is, is a term that comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people, people have, people literally say there's no such thing as truth. Alternative facts, the truth isn't true, and all of that kind of thing. That is, uh, that's, that's of course, is that is bullshit in the Frankfurt sense. You know, the uh, the, the Harry Frankfurt sense. It's the kind of, um, you know, it's, they don't even care whether something is true. Liars care about truth because they really they recognise it's valuable enough to to deceive people about it. Whereas bullshitters don't even care that it's not true. It's just effective for their strategic purposes. You know, that's 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 a that's a that's that's the situation we're sort of in. And people are fired up. People want meaning in their life, and they'll go to they'll go to things like religion or nationalism or, or, or identity politics on the left or the right to sort of get that, and it will provide that because you know. That's the kind of creatures we are. But unfortunately, because we've had – see, postmodernism was supposed to be this kind of, you know, you've heard the term the epistemic dandy, you're supposed to be free, and it's it's all lighthearted and jocular and nothing's taken seriously. You'll find that was a, a big feature in postmodernism of the 80s, say. But all that's gone now. So we're left with earnest uncertainty or earnest kind of scepticism about, about boundaries. Um yes. If only people didn't seek meaning in their lives, we wouldn't have any problems. Yeah, we wouldn't. We would, yeah, but we wouldn't. We wouldn't have any benefits either. It'd be, it'd be, <laughs> we'd just have the big problem that life wouldn't be worth living. Um, but it's yeah, it's 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 a thing. It's so it's 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 a situation where I think perhaps it's good for some people to stand up for certain principles of reason and the Enlightenment values and. And sort of liberal forms of progressivism in the in the in the proper sense of the term liberal, um, and and sort of it's good to stand for some people to stand up for those things. People like that, I think, are valuable at, at, at this time. But you can't expect everybody to listen or many people to listen because they think they have their own truths. They think they they think that you know they can if 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 they have some kind of narrative reason reason within their narrative not to trust the source or to trust what people say or to be charitable or, or, or think that people are trying to speak truthfully they'll just seize on it and because and they and they can't almost conceive of why that's not a good thing because you know they just they're just trapped in their own hermeneutics they're trapped in their own kind of personal hermeneutics via some kind of standpoint political theory about struggle with the other. Um, and, yeah, you, it, I suppose it's crafting narratives to deal with that. Yeah, it's crafting narratives that can deal with that rather than pander to it. Um, yeah, and that's that's an interesting challenge. It's not a challenge that's really being taken up at the moment. Narr most of the narratives in the popular culture are sort of pandering a bit too much to that. And try not to offend it in case, in case you know they get a Twitter storm comes after that. Uh -huh. um, that's that. No, you need to you need to have some courage. Courage is a, is, a, is an important virtue. It's cardinal virtue. Mm. Sorry, I think, question. <laughs> oh, I, I think what I have uh, when when I critique these things isn't so much uh, a courage, but uh, a character trait where I just I, I have this kind of addiction to looking for something that's wrong. Like even even with I, uh, ideas I agree with um, or people I really like, uh, I, I see them create a position, and I just feel this compulsion to try to tear it apart, just to, yeah. almost as a kind of game. Yeah, like where's the weak? Where's the weak part of that? I want to find the weak yeah. part. That's healthy. I mean that 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 is that's very healthy. It's healthy politically. It's healthy philosophically, um, because that 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 way that way we learn and we test things and we build up the skill to do it. And, and 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 you know that's that's a good skill to have. It's a virtue. It's a civic virtue, even. Yes, I think I think, you know, for me personally, uh, I find meaning in the process. Um, you know, I, I I I emphasize this in my classes as well. I I I would tell my students, I don't really care um, whether you get the right answer or not. If I see that uh, you you did the calculations um, correctly, and and I see that that uh, your line of reasoning made sense. I'm going to give you points for it, um, yeah. but if I see that like you got the right answer, but but the the reasoning was, was crap, yeah. 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 
that's 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 not as good because really it's not about having the right answer the the the, the sort of process of inquiry ultimately you'll never have completely right answers that's that's a pipe dream that that was Kant's contribution which was a good contribution you can't ultimately have the correct answer but it's 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 the methods we apply and the virtues we cultivate in in trying to find out because that way we make progress you know if we don't want to go back to the sort of pre-modern kind of the catholic church tells you how many lobes the liver has and when you look inside the body you ignore that there aren't that many lobes on a liver you know if we want to if we want to get if we don't want to sink back into that you know you you have to cultivate finding the faults and 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 calling things out when they don't they don't they don't they don't look like what we see well the theory says x but you see y you need to you need to point that out this is that lipman paper that's been in the news as well yes you yes I, I was i was about to ask about that actually uh, about the role that that this bastardization of phenomenology uh played in in allowing this this uh this farrar to take place it's it's in there somewhere yeah it's clearly in there somewhere um it's there's there's a there's this view that if if people that if people are on a sacred journey if trans trans people of all ages are on a sacred journey to some to the attainment of some uh, absent object and it's a great political struggle and 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 the usual the usual factors that confuse that like being imma immature, like being an adolescent, like being 14 years old and not knowing the fuck what you're on about, or, or sort of like um, the usual thing of the complexity of comorbidity, you know, get in the way. They, they they should be silent straight away because the sacred truth is in the is in is in is in is just in the in the feeling of the the the, the phenomenal the phenomenology of of, of uh, gender dysphoria is almost like the source of the truth itself wherever it occurs whatever the status of the person who's experiencing it <coughs> and it doesn't that that's there's there's a bit of that in there a lot of considerable amount of that in there you know and it's sorry carry on oh no i i just i had a thought that um many of these problems seem to emerge from what we might think of as, as, a, as a teleological view of meaning you know we have to acquire uh, you have to acquire this absent object or you have to preserve the future of your race and secure blah 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 white children blah 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 mm -hmm. well, so there's some some kind of end goal um in mind that, sure. that gives you meaning um whereas perhaps a more healthy uh approach would be to have a teleonomical view of meaning where you where you learn to love the process um of, of yeah, acquiring it's, knowledge it's, and information it's, it's, it's yeah it's not that there's some final cause it's that that there's there are virtues to be cultivated. You, the, there's, it's a law-based thing rather than a, than an end-based picture of, of 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 where purpose comes from. Because we do we do need purpose in your life, and it was neglected, perhaps when the world was a little more economically secure, or seems so, as, as it did the previous twenty years. But no, yeah, you, you know, there's we need meaning, but we need to we. we we need to be more critical of where we get meaning from. You know, we shouldn't just swallow it down or feel that because we're with a group who agree with us and like our tweets, then it that it's 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 going to be fine. Uh, yeah, and and that means that means yeah, abandoning kind of like you know again the grand meta about narratives that, that sort of offer cheap meaning and and sort of adopting a more virtue based view which is that yeah we, we we there are things that are good that we can cultivate and now they, they don't guarantee happy outcomes they you know they they they, they make them more likely <laughs> yeah and that's mm. that's 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 perhaps that's perhaps uh a, a wiser path to take than thinking that you're you're you, you have some end laid down for your life or some group identity that you must sort of try and find um, just just cultivate that that private capacity to reflect on conceptions of the good or even publicly acquired conceptions of the good. We each have that project, which is your thing of finding the faults. We all seem to have, or my, many people seem to have this capacity for sort of like, well, do I agree with that? And even reason can win people over. It just doesn't do so instantaneously in a Damascian flash you know, it isn't like it isn't like St. Paul on the road to Damascus. Yes, reason, yes. Re reason is insidious. 
it see it sows its seeds and it, it, and, it, and it waits for the crop it doesn't just bludgeon people with a blinding truth yes ben shapiro murders person with logic no, eventually you're now it's that kind of that's it wrecked yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all that kind of thing that's that's, that's not and i mean all of us have been involved in the 80s community on the internet over the years no that's not how it works yeah but, you know the, the, the reasons the reasons just sit there and they and people change often because the litman paper people grow up they become more mature these 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 this ability to reflect critically grows because you had to live in the real world and work in the real world with adults. So it's sort of like, it, it sort of develops anyway. And then things that people said years ago, suddenly you, you remember them. And, and rather than, you know, just laughing at them like you did before, you realize there's some wisdom in them. Mm. You know? So there yes, you go. It, it, takes, it takes the logical part of the brain a little bit of time to catch up with the emotional part. I've heard that yeah. somewhere, but I forget where. <laughs> it's system one and system two thinking, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, we have some questions in the comments section. Why don't we address those and then we'll uh, we'll call it a day. Okay. So uh, let's start with Denarchus. Um, what do you think scientific naturalism, which seems to be the current naturalist viewpoint, can take from critical theory and build upon itself to address the criticism? Um, what can it take on critical theory? Um, okay, you can extend scientific naturalism to actually begin to address the meta-ethical component of political questions and ideological questions. Um, there's some there's some research and investigation to be done into things like is or gaps and open question arguments. Um, and fields like that so that you can you can't do politics or morality like you do science they're different activities but i think what we can take from natural sciences is, is our best empirical theories might be able to tell some uh, tell us about the teleonomies and uh, and and and, and, and the, the natural histories of our uh, passions our moral passions and our political passions and tell us something of who we are and thus offer some guidance to how we could be better. So I think you can naturalize the meta-ethical aspect of political and social science. Is, is, that, is that a decent answer? <laughs> I know it's a controversial answer, but I hope it makes sense. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with it. Uh, let's see. Landon Knoll, a buddy of mine, he's uh, an astronomer. He says, what do you think might eventually replace this so-called meta postmodernist trend we seem to be boiling in? I guess he's asking what the next historical stage is. Historical stage is well, I don't know. What's what's gonna happen in the world? That's an interesting I mean what's probably what's gonna come to the fore is our over the next century is our relationship with the natural world. Um, because we've been quite abusive. <laughs> we were a part of the natural world, but we've been quite abusive to that. That's going to be a pressing issue. Um, so that might be that might be a a focus for a re a, a, re, a resurgent interest in naturalism in our part, you know, as our social and political structures as a part of the natural order. That, you know, because it could make sense to view them in that way if we find that that, that the, the climate is changing in a way that's deleterious to our social existence. Um, yeah, and there's gonna, the, you know, so yeah, I'd say that. I'd say at some point we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna revise modernism, a revised modernism. I think what happened with modernism in, in sort of like the, the pre 1962 kind of modernism was it did become arrogant and it, it did, you know, and, and it did, it did sort of become complacent to a little degree. I think postmodernism has come along with that and shook that. Uh, but what's going to replace the postmodernism, perhaps I hope, is sort of a revision of categories. So we, we, we learn from what the postmodern skepticism is, but we don't fall into it. We don't fall into it as a trap. We sort of like, we, we, we know that we can revise, the, you know, we, the concepts like 
a nation or race or sex are up for naturalistic revision rather than eliminativism or, you know, where you get rid of them altogether or <clears throat> what I call strategic conservation, where you just conserve them for political reasons. You know, that you, you, you're actually critical, you're actually skeptical about categories like race and sex and nation. <laughs> Uh, but rather than eliminate them, you say, ah, oh, but you can't say that I'm not a member of this group and I choose to weave my identity about around that. We can sort of get around past that and go, well, no, what we do is we um, we revise categories. We prepare to revise those categories in the light of our best empirical theories. So if I was being optimistic, I hope a resurgence in naturalism. Perhaps. <laughs> Anon is asking a follow-up question to Landon's. Does any of this really matter in the big historical picture anyway, or is it all just the petty squabbling of the day? Um, it matters. Everything's the petty squabble. If you take a historicist view, everything's the petty squabbles of the day. But the thing, the, the, the thing is you can learn from those squabbles. And yes, the, squabbles make... the squabbles are what we live for. Yeah, we you know we can we can we can we can whatever else though even though even though they're eye rollingly painful sometimes and sort of seem asinine to the nth degree, nevertheless they are discourse they are critical discourse and 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 they we they do sometimes make us think about what we think and you know and 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 and, and, and take a position that we're willing to defend because we feel outraged by something so we 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 learn from them anyway. And you know, so the, the the petty squabbles are aren't, aren't aren't that petty ultimately if they help us be better. All right. And uh, Jack Offson is asking a question about postmodernism. He says, "Hey Gary, what do you think of Stephen Hicks? Has he got it right on postmodernism that the religious philosophers from hundreds of years ago are to blame for the weird dismissal of science today?" Uh, I personally. I, I've I've not heard good things about Stephen Hicks, but I'll I'll let Gary. I don't know who is Stephen Hicks. He wrote um he wrote a book critiquing postmodernism. Uh, so I guess well that answers that question because his name sounds vaguely familiar, but I can't I can't I can't recall any details about him. So yeah, he's 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 an author. Uh, he's an author, isn't he? Um. <sighs> okay, so you have this situation where you have say pre-modernism which is before the sort of um before the age of trade and merchantilism and all that that goes on before that and and they had a particular way of view of the world and the and the and the, the medievalists the thomists and people like that belong to that kind of conception of the world um then you have the modernist which is the enlightenment and the early modern um I'm not sure that you can blame it on the religious people. Look, even some of our best traditions in science and in in, in political uh, schools like liberalism have their have their roots in religious ideas and thinking. This idea that that this idea that if we hadn't had religion, we'd all be living in Star Trek now, is, is it doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. I don't think. You know, for mm. example. If you have an idea in liberalism, like you have the idea of, uh, you have this idea that of public reason, that the, the people with power have to, um, have to have to put the case for their their power, their, their exercise of power in a way that appeals to the people over whom it's exercised. They're responsible to the people who to whom they have power over. That's got its roots in certain religious, Christian particularly, ideas. The idea that the, 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 the psychology is the battlefield between good and evil in each of us. God is play, God's war plays out in each of us. And ideas from Protestantism like the universal priesthood. <coughs> Those ideas fed into liberalism, even though, you know, the, 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 the lots of Christians are, are, are anti-liberal. Specifically, this particularly Catholicism, Catholicism tends to be anti-liberal um, because it thinks God's or the Church's uh, voice should should predominate rather than individual conscience. The individual conscience, in their view, is seen as being um, particularly liable to the machinations of the devil or something. But you know, nevertheless, those things are rooted 
in a certain Christian tradition. So I don't think, I mean, I don't know what, I can't criticize Hicks because I haven't read his book, but um, I, I don't think you can blame it all on religion. I don't think you can blame it all on, 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 on you know, on, you know, what people believed in the past. We inherit something of what they believe in from the from the past. And we can improve it. This is the thing about revision. Rather than either being in awe of it, like it has to guide us perfectly, like the past was perfect and they all knew what they were doing, or thinking that they were all rubbish and we should look to a complete, completely unfettered future. You know, what we should we take do. what works. We take what works. We 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 we're pragmatic. We're critical. We're rational. We you know we, we you know we 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 learn from the past, but we learn from its mistakes, and we don't we 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 don't have to be as conceited as the past because we know a bit more about the world in which we live. So yeah, you know that's 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 what I call revise again like revised modernism. It's a kind of revised modernism. It's not arrogantly shouting about the future. The future is good. Everything in the future is going to be good. Or oh, all the past was great and the future is good. It's, it's, it's being sceptical about dichotomies like that. Uh, and without, fall, without you know, being so open-minded that your brains fall out, which is postmodernism. Yes. It's a process-oriented approach. That's right. Uh, all respect right. the process. Respect the process. Yes. So we're coming up on an hour now. Um, do you have any final statements concerning any of the topics we discussed? It's been a, I think it's been a fruitful discussion. Um, uh, uh, not really. I think I think I've said enough. Um, you know, yeah. Um, go and read stuff for yourself. That's mine. That's read. Actually, actually read the stuff for yourself. There's, we've got the internet now. There's loads of material you can go and and, and, and educate yourself and think it through for yourself and. And you know that's that would be that's always my advice. That's always my final statement. Read and think, people. <laughs> Read and think. Well, that's a sound piece of advice. Thanks, Gary. Uh, why don't you stay on for a few minutes um, after I close this? And thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this time it has not been complete crock, but it's been close. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>